A detective's daughter isn't someone you would expect to become caught up in a true crime story. But in the case of Georgia Williams, that's exactly what happened. Now, Georgia wasn't this criminal's first victim, but investigators ensured she was certainly his last. Georgia was lured to the home of someone she felt completely comfortable around, someone she felt she could trust more than anyone else in the world. But this notion of trust was quickly shattered when Georgia realized she was in for a lot more than she bargained for. Georgia was subjected to what was likely hours upon hours of unspeakable terror, unlike anything you could imagine. What should have been a calm evening between friends turned into the stuff of nightmares. Georgia Williams was born on a cool day in mid-September back in 1995 in Shropshire, England. She had a sister who was a bit older than her, and the two would grow up in the home of their parents, Lynette and Steve Williams, with Steve being a detective. Georgia is remembered for being a very lively girl that was always full of energy, someone who could make friends with darn near anyone, the type of person many of us aspire to be. Growing up in her younger years, though, Georgia didn't always have it easy. When she was in middle school, she began to be bullied quite a lot. Thankfully, this bullying didn't last very long, and after enduring a few years of aggravation and pain, high school rolled around. And that's when things really began to take shape for Georgia. By the time she reached the age of 16 or 17, Georgia's luck had completely turned around. And not only was she now considered to be one of the popular girls, but she was eventually elected head girl of her class. Now, for anyone who may not be familiar with this term, myself included, that's basically the British equivalent of being class president, a single student who the others have elected to be the lead voice of the entire student body. Needless to say, Georgia had a pretty prosperous time in high school, and when her schooling finally began to wind down when she turned 17, she revealed that she planned on continuing her education so that she could become an Air Force paramedic, an incredibly noble position to aim for. In order to make these dreams a reality, though, she needed to fund her future education. And to do this, she opted to get a job at a local gas station. After beginning work at the gas station, Georgia made friends incredibly quickly. It didn't take long before she was on good terms with every member of staff. But there was one guy in particular who Georgia took an interest in. She noted that he was incredibly shy and didn't really hang out with the rest of the team. But she wanted to change that. Knowing all too well how it felt to be an outcast in her younger years, Georgia made sure to take time with this guy to make sure he felt welcomed and accepted. This man would be Jamie Reynolds, who was about 22 years old at the time. Georgia went out of her way to make sure Jamie was invited to all of the coworkers' get-togethers and gatherings. While he wasn't the type of person to really be seen in a social or a public setting, well, things quickly changed. As soon as he began hanging out with Georgia, it was like his entire personality changed. While he'd previously been reserved, awkward, and shy, his confidence had finally come to the surface. It was clear that there was a deep bond developing between the two, but it seems like they weren't really on the same page. As you probably have come to expect, before long, Jamie had fallen head over heels for Georgia. But there was one problem. She didn't really feel the same way about it. Jamie ended up asking Georgia out on a couple of dates, but she turned him down and explained that she wasn't really looking for a boyfriend at the moment. She was more focused on making her career dreams a reality. And she explained to him in the gentlest way that she could that she just wanted to be friends. Jamie was understandably upset about this, but he made it clear that he completely understood why Georgia had turned him down. He took the letdown in stride and basically just let it go. Or so it seemed. As anyone who's been rejected knows, being turned down isn't always easy. Now, it's simple enough to let the situation pass and move on with your life. But just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy. Jamie understood this all too well, because this was one of the hardest things he'd ever done. It would seem that Georgia was one of the only people who was ever really willing to give Jamie the time of day, and he was terrified of letting her slip away. So he concocted a plan to make sure that would never happen. By the time Jamie turned 23, he and Georgia had been friends for the better part of a year. Feeling like he could confide in her, he'd spoken with Georgia multiple times about how unsatisfied he was with his life. 
He couldn't fathom the thought that the best life would ever be for him was working a job at a gas station. He wanted more, and who could blame him? Georgia spoke with him about what his dreams were, what his hobbies may have been, and what he wanted to do with his life. Jamie explained that one of the biggest passions of his was photography, and that's when Georgia suggested that he try taking up a job as a photographer, find some people to shoot photos for, maybe do weddings, things of that nature. Jamie loved this idea. So much so that he asked Georgia to help him establish a professional portfolio to show off his work. Not only this, but he asked Georgia to be his first model, and she jumped at the opportunity to help out her friend. The plan was for Georgia and a few others to head over to Jamie's house on May 26, 2013. They'd planned a huge photo shoot for that day so that Jamie would be able to get heaps of photos of various people to ensure his portfolio was as diverse as possible. The only problem was, Georgia would soon learn that her family had planned a big barbecue party that same day, and her grandparents would be coming to town for a short visit as well. Georgia did not want to miss this barbecue, but she also didn't want to let Jamie down. She knew that the two only lived about four or five minutes apart, so she decided to get dressed up and go do the photo shoot, then hurry home afterwards so that she could spend time with her grandparents. She did her hair, put on jeans and a leather jacket, and then took off. It would be around 7.30 that evening when Georgia headed off towards Jamie's house. Her family expected her to be back within a fairly short amount of time, maybe 30 minutes to an hour or so, but when three full hours had passed by, they started to get a bit concerned. They weren't worried or anything, but they couldn't understand what had been taking so long. Her mother ended up texting her to make sure everything was going okay, and Georgia explained that they'd finished the photo shoot quite a while ago and that she'd been hanging out with friends there and she simply lost track of time. Georgia explained that she would probably not be home until fairly late that night, letting them know not to wait up for her. With that, her parents turned in for the night, but they had no idea that the person they'd been texting it wasn't Georgia. By the following morning at 6.30 a.m., Georgia's mother quickly realized that Georgia still hadn't returned home. This is when things really began to become bizarre, because her mother knew that Georgia had a music festival scheduled later that day, and she wouldn't miss it for the world. She'd been planning on attending for weeks. Her parents assumed that she'd probably just be heading off to the festival from her friend's house, so again, they didn't put too much thought into it. After all, Georgia had never been the type of person to get into trouble, so they assumed she had it all figured out, as she always did. By later that evening, though, they started to get suspicious. See, Georgia didn't have her driver's license just yet, and she was taking driving classes before actually taking her test to ensure that she knew the ins and outs of everything. Her classes were scheduled to take place early the next day, so her parents expected her to return home later that evening, but she never did. They waited up late that night, expecting her to come home at any moment, but they never heard a word from her. She also stopped responding to texts and calls. By late that evening, her parents had taken to calling friends, family, anyone who may have seen Georgia, but no one had. When Georgia still hadn't returned home the next morning and eventually missed her driving lesson, that's when her parents called the police to file a missing person report. When police showed up at the Williams' home later that day to take their statements, they asked all the usual questions, including when they'd last seen their daughter and where she was supposed to have been. Her parents explained that the last they knew, she'd headed off to a photo shoot at her friend Jamie's house. Admittedly, this wasn't much information to work with, but the obvious first step was to look into Jamie and see what he may know about her disappearance. But as officers began to look up information in their database about Jamie, they were shocked, to say the least. As they brought up Jamie's profile in their system, they quickly learned that Jamie was caught by officers back in 2008 for attempting to claim the life of a teenage girl. The crazy thing is, the police didn't actually arrest him, nor was he charged with a single crime. Now, I'm sure there's more to the story than what's been reported, but this definitely seems bizarre to me. In the end, Jamie was just given a warning and was allowed to walk away without any repercussions, while this innocent girl was left with lifelong trauma. This seems utterly nuts to me, but again, I feel like there has to be more to the story than this. Surely the police weren't this negligent, but the truth is, maybe they were. 
Thankfully, investigators weren't willing to take George's case so lightly. They knew now that Jamie had a history of violence, so they began the hunt for Georgia, firing on all cylinders. They showed up at Jamie's door and knocked, but received no response. Desperate for answers, they didn't waste any time. They kicked down his door and forced their way inside. They searched every inch of the home, but didn't find any signs of Jamie. They immediately sent out calls for help, and Jamie was now considered to be a wanted man. Detectives first went to the gas station where Jamie and Georgia worked, but none of their coworkers had seen them in days and both of them had missed their shifts. This was not good news. They tracked down details of Jamie's van and sent out information to all available officers to be on the lookout for the vehicle. After searching the ends of the earth for any sign of him, officers eventually tracked him down more than 200 miles away in Scotland of all places. This man hadn't just skipped town, he fled the country entirely. This was all the info police needed to know that Jamie was up to something. But what was it? When police questioned him about Georgia, he quickly pulled the I don't know card and left it at that, insisting he had no knowledge of where Georgia went after the photo shoot that day. Investigators weren't having any of it. They detained him and transported him all the way back to Shropshire for a proper interrogation. But the news that he would reveal well, it wasn't anything that George's family wanted to hear. Police were now highly suspicious of Jamie. In fact, the text messages that George's family had received on the night that she went missing, now these were getting called into question as well, as Jamie may have been the one to send them. Considering he had a history of assault and was found while fleeing the country, police now had enough evidence to search his home for clues about Georgia. They didn't know how he was involved in her disappearance, but they felt highly confident, at the very least, that he knew more than he was letting on about Georgia. As they searched his home, they managed to track down the camera that he'd been using on the day of the photo shoot. Lucky for them, the SD card was still inside the camera too. The only problem was the card had been completely wiped. Not a single photo remained. But investigators weren't going to let this stop them. Detectives brought the SD card to their digital forensics team, and without much issue, the team was able to recover all of the deleted photos. See, when you delete a photo off of something like an SD card or a hard drive, those photos aren't actually deleted. To put it in super simple terms, they basically just be moved to a hidden folder where they'll just sit there and wait until that space is needed for other files, then they'll be gradually deleted one by one. You could think of it as throwing something in the trash, but not taking the trash out. Yes, the trash is out of your way, but until it gets taken to the dump, it's easy enough to just take things back out of the bin. That's basically how these photos were recovered. When forensic specialists managed to recover the photos, nothing could prepare them for what they had found. Turns out Jamie did have a photo shoot that day, but he and Georgia were the only ones in attendance. Unbeknownst to Georgia, no one else had ever even been invited. The photo shoot began like any regular photo shoot. There were various photos of Georgia looking happy, smiling, and posing. But all of a sudden, the tone of the images shifted. Soon, Georgia's clothes were missing. Things only got worse from here, as the next few photos showed Georgia with a rope hanging loosely around her neck with a very concerned, terrified expression on her face. The next few photos, well, they were worse. It was incredibly clear that Georgia was being held against her will. What was even more clear is that between two of the photos, things took a tragic turn and Georgia had now lost her life. Immediately after Georgia's life had been taken, Jamie continued to take hundreds of other photos, literally hundreds, of her in various poses at different angles, so on and so forth. I truly can't get into all of the details of what these photos showed, but it was unlike anything you could ever imagine. This was horrendous, and that's putting it so, so lightly. Police continued to search Jamie's home, and that's when they found, in addition to the photos of Georgia, a minimum of 16,800 photos that showed incredibly violent acts being carried out on various people. Detectives don't believe Jamie took all of these photos himself if he took any of them at all, but simply possessing them was a crime. There were also 72 graphic videos that were found as well, and again, each was more and more violent than the one before it. Considering Jamie was still living with his parents when all of this came to light, his parents were asked to speak with officers to give their side of the story, 
hoping they could shed some light on the situation and explain how all of this had taken place and how Jamie managed to get a hold of these photos and videos. What his parents told the police was downright shocking because what police had found in Jamie's room, it was nothing new. In fact, his parents had known about it for the better part of a decade. When all of this was taking place, the photo shoot, the crime, and everything in between, Jamie's parents had been out of town on vacation. But as soon as they got the call from investigators about Jamie's arrest, they rushed back home as quickly as they could. When police confronted the couple about what they'd found in Jamie's room, their jaws hit the floor. See, they knew about Jamie's, well, fantasies, to put it lightly. They knew that he'd been watching violent sexual videos for quite some time. When the police pressed them about this issue, Jamie's parents admitted they'd first caught Jamie watching videos like this when he was just 14 years old. After this discovery, his parents reached out to their internet provider and had them block access to these websites. But that's pretty much all that was ever said about the situation. To make matters worse, I feel the need to clarify that this is simply when his parents caught him watching these videos. That doesn't mean it was the first time he'd ever done it. Truth be told, he could have been watching stuff like this since he was in middle school. We just don't know. But here's where things get crazy. When Jamie found out that his parents had blocked access to these websites, he actually called the internet provider himself and paid for his own private internet connection. His parents were none the wiser. Each month, he would pay the bill with his own money, and his parents never had a clue. When his parents did eventually find out about his private internet access, they decided to call the police as well as Child Protective Services. From what I've gathered, neither of these parties did anything to actually fix the situation. I found one report that claimed that possessing these videos isn't even illegal in England, but I personally find that hard to believe. If these videos were as violent as some sources suggest they are, then they may have been documenting actual crimes, which in fact is a crime in and of itself, at least here in the States. I feel it's safe to assume that this would be a crime in England as well, but I may be wrong. But regardless, no one did anything about it. Jamie wasn't willing to obey his parents, and despite their constant complaining, he made it very clear that he was going to do what he wanted to do, and there was nothing they could do to stop it. Jamie continued to grow up surrounded by this incredibly damaging content, and needless to say, it had a profound effect on him in his later years, as is evidenced by this very case. When police continued searching Jamie's home after his arrest, they managed to track down at least 40 separate notepads on which Jamie had written stories and fantasies about what he wanted to do to Georgia, as well as various other women. Now, these weren't your typical fan fiction type stuff that you'd find on the internet. No, these were highly detailed, incredibly graphic stories about what he planned to do to a woman if he was ever given the opportunity. Each of these stories ended the same way, with the females losing their lives. As police combed through each and every one of these stories, they found one that caught their eye. It was titled Georgia Williams in Surprise. The story documented in explicit detail exactly what happened to Georgia that day. It was like a play-by-play -play of the crime. According to one article, police say that he began writing the story in January and finished writing it just a few weeks before the crime actually unfolded. When police confronted Jamie about this story, he didn't budge. He continued to claim that he was innocent and was 100% uncooperative with the investigation. This meant police had to resort to good old-fashioned detective work to figure out what exactly had happened to Georgia and where she was now. Their investigation first began at a gas station nearby. It's unclear if this is the same station where the two had worked or if this was a different station entirely. Jamie was caught on CCTV here, filling up his van with gas. It's believed that at this very moment, Georgia had already been stowed away in the back of the vehicle. Immediately after getting gas, he drove to a nearby movie theater and watched a movie, all while Georgia was still in the back of the van, just leaving her there for hours while he laughed it up inside the theater. Police weren't sure where he went after this, but a few witnesses later reached out and explained that they'd seen that exact van driving through a mountain road in North Wales. As it would turn out, while driving through the area, Jamie's van got stuck in the mud, and a few people actually helped him get his van unstuck and back onto the road. All the while, Georgia was likely still in the back. This is what led police to head to the woods where the van was stuck and check out the surrounding area. Sure enough, in the thick brush of the woods, 
they found George's body, tossed amongst the trees like some animal. It should go without saying that at his trial a short while later, Jamie was found guilty. Interestingly, he'd been proclaiming his innocence all the way up until the very day of the trial. Then, as he stood before the court, he finally changed his tone and pleaded guilty. He was the youngest person in English history to be given a life sentence with no possibility of parole. In the wake of the trial, it came to light, not only did the police fail the public back in 2008 when Jamie tried to take the life of that teenage girl, but various other institutions also failed to properly get this man off the streets. A mental health nurse made a public statement in which she said that she knew about Jamie's violent behavior years before the trial. She recalled a series of photos that Jamie had drawn, presumably when he was a child, each of which depicted a woman with a rope hanging around her neck. According to this nurse, nothing was done about this and the situation just faded away. Now, she didn't say this part outright, but her verbiage led me to believe that she may have attempted to speak with investigators about this, but it didn't really go anywhere if so. By this point, Jamie's parents were also well aware of his violent tendencies, having caught him watching the aforementioned videos on multiple occasions. His parents did everything they knew how to do, but outside of kicking Jamie outside of their house, what can you do if your child just outright refuses to cooperate? Now, I suppose he could have been involuntarily admitted somewhere, and surely if his parents knew just how bad this behavior was, they would have explored that. But the truth is, this case can't just be blamed on one person. Jamie isn't the only one responsible. If he'd gotten the help he needed when he was younger, it's likely that none of this would have ever happened. And I'm not blaming his parents for this by any means. From the reports I've read, they legitimately did their best. The mental health nurse that he saw also seems to have done her best to bring awareness to the situation, and the poor teenager who he attacked also seems to have done her part. But the investigative teams at each of these institutions just fail. There's no other way to explain it. Let this be a lesson to parents everywhere. Take note of what your children are doing on the internet, what content they watch, what games they play, who they're speaking to. Cases like this don't have to happen. Stories like this don't have to be told. If something seems a bit weird, chances are it's because it's weird. If your kid is watching something you don't understand, take the time to understand it and make an educated judgment call. If you catch your child repeatedly watching content like this, it's your job to go as far as you need to to keep them safe. Cancel your internet entirely if you have to. Take their phone, their computer, tablet, whatever it is, and throw that junk in the trash if that's what it takes. I don't, I don't care what it costs. We're all responsible for the children in our lives, even if they're not our own. It's our job to keep these children safe and keep tabs on them until they're old enough to make good decisions on their own. If something strange is going on with your kid, it is never too early to reach out to a professional for help. There's no shame in it either. It doesn't make you a failed parent or a guardian if you learn that your kid needs more help than you can provide. What makes you a failed parent or guardian is if you're unwilling to reach out and admit when both you and your kid need help. Ultimately, in Jamie's situation, his parents didn't know just how disturbed he really was. And his parents reached out to the police and mental health experts, but sadly, that still wasn't enough because their cries fell on deaf ears. I don't know who to think is responsible for this, but I do feel with every ounce of my being that this could have been avoided didn't have to end this way. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. You can also click that blue join button below to support the channel and see new videos long before everyone else does. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.